Welcome back to the 207th episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex. And today we're going to be flipping through some of the top stories, including how Biden's doubling down on some of his policies, and we'll see if it works for him in 2024. The beginning of 2024 is looking a little rough for the House, and we'll go into some of the key problems they're facing. And an interesting last article that we'll briefly touch on about how America doesn't have enough experts on Chinese culture, which could hurt us in the long run. And of course, we'll end today with our daily delight, a story meant to leave you feeling positive and ready to take on the day. Now, that's enough rambling for me. Let's jump in to our daily debate. So if everything keeps going on the path that's going on right now, and Joe Biden's to double down on all of his messages, he's not to uh, pivot strategically, then do you think he will be elected in 2024? There are lots of different opinions out there. There's lots of different commentary out there. I won't necessarily give you mine until we get into the article, but I want to know what you guys think. So throw it down in the comment section, and let's jump into our first article that comes from The Daily Caller. The headline reads, Double Down on Bidenomics. We asked political insiders what Joe Biden's New Year resolution should be. So this is giving an outside perspective, and they're asking directly, should Biden keep on rolling with Bidenomics and double down, or should he strategically pivot, like I highlighted at the very beginning? So I'm going to read from the first paragraph so we can kind of get an idea of where they're coming from, what kind of insiders they talk to, and then it can kind of start the conversation off and maybe you'll have some insights from these first few paragraphs rather than just listening to me rant for the little first bit. Quote, with the first year ahead, sorry, a fresh year ahead, the presidential election in sight, both Republican and Democratic strategists have suggestions for what New Year resolutions President Joe Biden should make. Biden is exiting 2023 with flourish, floundering poll numbers that show the president has a low approval rating and is trailing in a hypothetical matchup between him and former President Donald Trump, both nationally and in key swing states. In an effort to turn things around or to keep the president on the same decline, Republican and Democratic strategists suggest Biden play into his age, focus on Bidenomics, and stay calm. So those three top issues— Focus on Bidenomics. Now, you could take both of these uh, or this one from both perspectives. If it's the Republicans are saying, yeah, focus on Bidenomics because apparently it's not really resonating. People are kind of laughing or they're angry that people in the White House administration are saying, oh, Bidenomics is working. And they're probably on the Republican side saying, yeah, yeah, keep playing into this one. And Democrats are probably saying, well, yeah, yeah, actually keep playing into this one, keep touting it, and maybe throughout the course of the year, then they'll be able to see these sort of benefits. And the inverse could be true, where the Republicans are saying, no, you need to stop touting it, please stop touting it, because maybe there will be some big bounce backs going into 2024, and the Democrats could be the opposite way, saying it's not resonating with the people who don't keep going about Bidenomics. So there's lots of different perspectives from both sides about Bidenomics. So I think you've probably heard this conversation multiple times. I don't think we need to really go into that one, or unless we're going to have a specific article about it in the future. The one that I thought was really interesting is Biden should play into his age. And this is something that he did in the previous election as well. He talked about how he's the return to normalcy because he's been in Washington for so long. He's just kind of been, I don't want to say he's been in the background because he did run for president a few times, but he was just a normal senator from Delaware. He was the vice president. He is the Washington establishment embodied, or at least the older Washington establishment embodied. And the Democrats, they even talk about how talking about his age, even though it can be somewhat of a downfall, they want to turn his greatest weakness, and you hear this from lots of different political strategists, you want to turn the greatest weakness of your candidate into their strength. So not only do you take away a leg from the other side, but you actually turn around their message, and every single time that someone mentions that he's old, the counter message, oh, but he's wise, he's learned, he's spent a lot of time understanding how the system works, and he has lots of connections across the nation and overseas. So you can kind of spin the message, and like I said, every single time it gets brought up, the people who are already supporting you, it doesn't resonate as much because, one, they've heard the counter message, but two, they can actually spread that counter message. And when somebody brings that up in an argument, they can say, but don't you think that brings a little bit of wisdom and so on and so forth? So 
that sort of thing, spinning the negatives into the positives, I think is a very interesting strategy. And when I heard it from this article, I was like, okay, yes, we've seen some of this spin before. It hasn't necessarily taken up, but maybe this time they'll be more successful about getting Biden into office with this sort of message. And then stay calm. This one, I think, is another one that's uh, interesting, to, to say the least, because his numbers right now are not looking good. And yet Biden's still out there talking about his message. He's not trying to pivot so much on Bidenomics, which tells me that they are staying calm internally. They're saying, no, no, our message will resonate eventually. But if you stay too calm and you become too be complacent because of it, then you're not actually going to be able to shift when you start to realize that your message isn't working, period, full stop. So I think the stay calm aspect they need to make sure that they're not overdoing it on that one because they stayed extremely calm during the last election in 2020 when they got Biden into office. He was in the basement, not responding to many things, you know, barely getting out there and doing press. And that may have worked then because of the COVID pandemic and him being able to, you know, the quote is on the right side, hide in the basement. He may have been able to get away with that then, but I don't know if he'll be able to get away with that now. So he might have to go a little bit more on the offensive, especially because he is the president now. He doesn't want to look weak against an outside candidate or even on the world stage. He doesn't want to look weak like certain arguments and certain legitimate grievances and problems with his policy can't go unaddressed. So he does have to get out there. He can't just say, stay so calm and sit there and be like, oh, no, I can take these barrages. No problem whatsoever. So I want to jump to the second most important quote in this one, which they're talking a little bit about Bidenomics. And I said, yes, we're going to skip on that. I wanted to skip on my pure opinion on it. And I wanted to get to some of the experts analysis. Quote, aside from concerns about the president's age, Biden and his administrations have faced backlash for their messaging surrounding the president's economic policy, more commonly known as Bidenomics more commonly known as Bionomics, or they, they gave it the name Bionomics. It's a little <laughs> interesting. They're saying, oh, more commonly known as. It was a joke that, oh, yeah, it's Bionomics when people were hating on it, but then they adopted it themselves and they started to brand it that. So we don't have to say, oh, commonly known as. Just say what they're calling it. There you go. Quote, while the White House continues to claim the economy is improving, improving even saying that Thanksgiving in 2023 was one of the cheapest ever, the American people are not convinced. 75% of U.S. adults said in September that the economy is in a fair or poor state, while 61% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. And we're going to jump to this next quote. Quote, Democrats previously warned the administration that the messaging was not working, with some even begging the White House to drop Bidenomics out of fear that the aggressive push of a booming economy may be upsetting Americans who are struggling. So you, you hear that messaging there. There's the people who are freaking out, who are saying, no, 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 you need to drop Bidenomics. And then the Biden team's like, no, no, we're going to stay calm. We're going to keep messaging our Bidenomics. We think that it will resonate eventually. There's a little tidbit of truth there, which is the labor market's doing extremely well. The stock market has rebounded. Supply chains have gotten better. And they're going to extrapolate that and push that forward, really claiming that they are the ones that have engineered this rebuilding of the American economy after covid rather than possibly a counter-argument that, no, the economy would have rebounded anyway because it was an artificial suppression during COVID. But their Bidenomics, you know, the Biden team, they're trying to take advantage of it. Don't waste a political moment. So they're going to try to make sure that whenever the economy is brought up, when it is positive, it is Bidenomics. But as we discussed before, that does have the inverse effect because if one, people don't feel happy with the economy. They feel like they're being patronized and talked down to. Even if they feel the economy is okay, you know, it's not the best, and they understand where Biden is coming from, there's still that mental association of the current state being Bidenomics and then comparing it to Trump. And then there's also the third and final one, which is if, I don't want to use curse words, if stuff hits the fan going into 2024 and the economy falls down and the bottom falls out, then guess what? Labeling it Bidenomics isn't going to be a good thing. And of course, at that point, that is when the team, the Biden team, is definitely going to have to pivot. If they don't, then they're going to be, uh, how do I say it nicely? They're going to be in for a, a shock or maybe not even a shock. They may be fully aware of what will happen and be ready for it in the election. But 
let's hope that honestly, I don't, you know, some people were probably cynical saying, hey, it's going to happen anyway. Why not let it happen underneath Biden so he doesn't get reelected? I don't hope economic hard times on anybody, no matter how much I agree, disagree with any politician just to benefit one political party. At the end of the day, I hope nothing does happen. I, I hope that the flaws in Biden's system, just like the flaws in any other system of any elected politician, come out. The people can vote on it. And if they feel the economy isn't working for them, great. Go out, make your voice heard. But I'm not going to wish economic hard times on anybody because it's it's hard nowadays as it is with the inflation, we, especially with a lot of people, you know, my generation coming out of 2008, seeing the hardships that that caused and now coming into a situation which it's OK. There, there's a good amount of employment. There was a joke in college, all oh, this job economy when we get out. And it wasn't always the best and it still isn't the best, but it, it's better than if you, some people were coming out of college after 2008 when it was an actual recession. And it wasn't just, like, let's be clear, we had a recession during the last few years. We did have two quarters of negative GDP growth. But we're, we're kind of ignoring that, and it didn't really hit the public conscious as much versus in 2008 when it hit the public conscious and people were being very reserved with their money and their employment uh, processes. So th it's not as bad as then. So let's just hope it doesn't fall out even more because there's a whole generation of people who have already been limited, who are coming through college, high school right now, and they've already been limited by what happened with COVID. They already had their education stunted and to have any of their opportunities stunted as they come out into the workforce. It just, it would be terrible. I don't want people to lose their pension funds. So at the end of the day, no matter what happens, whether good, bad, or ugly, Biden has a few different paths forward. And there are lots of strategists on all different sides telling him how to go about it. But if you have any specific things that you think he could improve, that you think he should switch up on, just like I kind of mentioned in the daily debate, throw it down there. Now that you have a little bit more insight, you have some of the talking points of the experts, maybe you agree or disagree with my interpretation of them or even what the experts were saying if you agree or disagree. Throw it down in the comment section. I'd love to hear what everybody has to say. So let's jump to our second article that comes from the Washington Examiner. The headline reads, 12 Days of Wexmas. Republicans head into 2024 with deep intraparty divisions. And, hey, we, we know this story at this point. Uh, if you're somebody who is Republican-leaning, it's probably very frustrating. If you're someone on the Democratic side, you're saying, whoop. B, let's go, baby. Yeah, there's a little bit of division there. They're not going to be able to put forward any of their agenda items. And if anything, it shows a little bit of defunction. So maybe people will be frustrated and vote them out of office in the upcoming election. And maybe that works its way up the ballot. That's a possibility. I don't know if that will actually happen. But there are those out there that I've talked to that have that sort of perspective. So let's hope that... For the sake of the Republicans, this gets fixed. And like I said, if you're a Democrat, you are praying that it stays exactly as it is. And this all really started about a year ago. But I'm going to leave it to the beginning paragraph of this article to really describe the situation as it is now. Quote, in the spirit of the season, the Washington Examiner has identified 12 issues we believe will shape 2024. The House Republican Conference is going into the new year sharply divided as members of the conference across the spectrum continue to try and recover from a year of turmoil. A year of turmoil? What do you mean? Barely being able to get a speaker elected, then having a provision where only one person is necessary to dissent to the speaker's abilities and their track record and, uh, you know, having them in the speakership office and then actually having that one person stand up and get a vote of no confidence and then getting him kicked out and then getting Mike Johnson back in and basically getting nothing done because most bipartisan efforts, unless it was military funding, were not happening. And then having possible, like, you, you understand, I, I could go on and on about the year. So yes, it was a tumultuous year. And the fact that it needs to bring it back up, I don't think the article needed to start that way. But just for context, for the people who don't know, that's where they're starting. Quote, when the House arrived in January, it took 15 rounds. So this is last January, by the way. It took 15 rounds and four days to elect a speaker as members led by Rep. Matt Gates lined up to oppose former Republican Kevin McCarthy's uh, bid for the speakership. And while he eventually got the gavel, it came at the cost of se several concessions, including the threshold to trigger a motion to vacate being dropped down to one member. We talked about that one. There was the debt ceiling battle they go on to elaborate on. And then they talk about the eight of them that you know were led by Gates, who actually got McCarthy out of there. So, yes, that's describing the, the last year. What's the next phase going to look like? Quote, 
Hardline conservatives fed up with what they view as Johnson's caving to the Democrats and the Senate's demands have successfully blocked rules and tried to take down other pieces of legislation. And while they largely haven't been successful, they've been loud and a thorn in Johnson's side. So just like McCarthy, where there was a certain number of people who could really stray from the consensus and stray from the middle because they know that with one person being able to put up a motion to vacate, they can really harass a uh, speaker just like they did for McCarthy. They, they know that they can leverage this. So that's why this sort of thing is a pain in the butt. So. If you're somebody observing from the outside, you're probably thinking, okay, this one person to vacate. This is an interesting motion. It, is it a good thing that the smallest the number of people, the one person, can actually try to uh, push a certain person out of the office? Is it good that that one person can try to hold them accountable? Maybe. But also, is it good for the functioning of the party or for the House itself? Because at the end of the day, the purpose of the party mechanism, the caucuses within the House and within the Senate, in let's be clear, this only applies to the House, but in general, the party system, the caucuses system that they have set up is meant to pull people from further away on particular issues and get them to be a voting block in order to persuade other people on the other side that, hey, we have enough on this side to get it passed, but if you want some of your initiatives in there and you agree, then maybe you can jump on and help out here. But when you have one person, all it takes is one person to dissent from the mainstream opinion and the person who's leading that mainstream opinion, a.k.a. the speaker, then when you can raise all that noise and you can leverage the fact that all they have to do is say, oh, I want a vote of no confidence, I want a vote to vacate the chair, that chair has to take their opinion more seriously, and that actually pulls them further away from the center, which makes it harder to negotiate. And is that a good thing in our system? Our system is meant to be slow. I've talked about this before. I've had, I had conversations about this my first year in uh, the college that I finished at with a professor who said that the system isn't actually meant to be this slow, or sorry, he said the si system shouldn't be this slow. He wasn't trying to make a argument that it wasn't meant to be this slow. And I made the argument that it's meant to be this slow, and it should because it forces concessions from a whole bunch of different sides. But the point of those concessions is not to pull us to extremes, but rather to pull us to the middle where a lot of people are going to be, or at least where more people are and are willing to concede on small things because as you go further to the extremes, then you have to ex you may have a few little things that everybody agrees on, but you have to concede on big things rather than you agree on a lot in the middle, but when you're conceding, it's on small things and they're bearable things. So that's how our system should be. It should be slow and painful. But is this too slow and painful? Maybe I'm starting to understand where he came from a little bit. He's lived a life of uh, a little bit of, how should I say, uh, non-contentment of the way that things are moving so slow, especially some of his policy agenda that he was uh, he would talk about with me personally. And now maybe I'm getting where he's coming from, which is, do we really want it to be this slow? Then again, then again, I also agree that government not doing a whole lot isn't necessarily a bad thing. But there is the question of, if the legislative and the legislator is not doing a lot and the executive really wants some certain policy agenda things done so that they can uh, get a positive election result or they can just serve the people that they were put into the office to serve, they're going to start exerting executive actions, executive powers through their bureaucracies and things of that nature, uh, rules and regulation making that really congrue and pull a lot of extra aspects of the governance process into the executive rather than allowing it to be in the legislative. And I think that there's a solid argument there. The argument that uh, the government's meant to do things for the people, uh, it resonates a little bit, but not too much. But the argument that we need a functioning legislator so the executive cannot try to uh, vacuum in so many extra privilege, privileges, rights, and governance abilities because they see that the legislator can't help them or get their agenda passed whatsoever. I think that that's a legitimate argument that could resonate with me because at the same time, it's not necessarily expanding the power of the legislator. It's allowing the legislator to do its initial purview to stay within its governing bounds while also preventing the executive from going past its governing bounds. So I, I can see the argument there for that. But that's I got really far off topic. But the point I was trying to get with that question is, 
is there so much to function out that it actually cannot proceed in a way that is productive whatsoever. And that's exactly what the Daily Caller is trying to get at. They're saying Mike Johnson is coming into a crazy year, especially with an election coming. It is going to be a pain in the butt. And a lot of these people are also up for elections, so they're going to be vying for their certain issues that will resonate in their districts. And if Mike Johnson is trying to push something through that they might not agree with, they may stand there if they're in a really far uh, district, a uh, district that goes very far to the right or has a very, very conservative base. They may be a pain in Johnson's side just so that they can say to their electors, hey, I did not pass that extremely large spending bill because I knew that it would up the amount of money that would be coming out of your pocket on taxes, or even that I knew that all that extra government spending would devalue your dollar. You may see a lot of peel-offs like that, and Johnson can't just try to whip them into line because all it takes is one person to use that leverage and say, well, really? I think that you're not performing your job to the best of your abilities, and then boom, there's another vote to get Mike Johnson out of there just like they kicked out McCarthy. So it's going to be a very, very interesting year, and we will see how that ends up. Uh, if you want to read that article, the whole thing, they don't actually go, they talk about 12 different things, kind of, they kind of glance over some of them. I would say it's more like talking about six main things and six other things, but uh, it's an interesting read for sure. The link is in the description below that like and subscribe button. You can find all the stories there from today. So let's jump to our next article that comes from the Washington Post. And the headline reads, where have all the American Chinese experts gone? So, at the beginning of this podcast, I had, I don't, hmm, there's not a nice way to say, it. I was very passionate about China, and I still am. I still believe that they are the rising rival of the United States. You know, I'm pretty sure most people agree with that economically, at least. I think militarily and culturally, they're trying to uh, exert more force as well. And I think that we need to take them extremely seriously. When Biden put restrictions on getting certain products or different selling certain chips or different pieces of equipment that could be used to make chips and those sort of sanctions, quote unquote, were put on the Chinese companies and they were forcing other countries, not ju not just our country, to limit the amount of things that we're shipping to China, but we were actually forcing other countries and their companies within those borders to not ship certain products to China with the threat that we're going to uh, not send them things or we're going to restrict funding and things like this. Uh, I was I was half on board, half on that. I, I was questioning whether or not that would actually force China to become completely solely uh, dependent, which means if we do go to war with economic sanctions and threats of, you know, taking back these sort of privileges that we've been giving them, like sending them microchips, that may not work anymore because now they'll be independent enough that they won't depend on those supply chains. But also in crippling them and making sure that they don't become so self-sufficient and so top of the line at creating these things that they can do it all domestically and therefore they don't have to rely on the outside world. I think there's a double-edged sword there and that's why I came down mixed on it. I, I do think that in the grand scheme of things, the protectionist policy, uh, I think that it's a good way to go forward with China. I don't think it's a good way to go forward with the United States. And that may sound a little weird. I think that having it so that the protectionist policies insulate our different supply chains, our companies, is actually going to hurt them in the long run because they're not going to face external competition and things of this nature. They're going to have the government basically saying, you're a protected industry, so you don't get the exact same treatment as other industries within the United States, and that's the government putting its thumb on the scale. And then also these com companies get used to having certain tariffs in place, so eventually if those tariffs do get removed, they may not be able to compete on the same level of other companies who are trying to infiltrate the U.S. market or vice versa, when they go to other countries, they may not be able to compete with some of the local brands because they've been in a protected industry for so long. But I do agree with the strategic mission of making sure that China's capabilities are limited or at least limiting the amount that we can do to aid them. I think it's a little bit of an extra step to force our allies to not do commerce with them. But at the end of the day, if you want to make a national security argument, I would be at least open to hearing that one. So I have been on this China issue for quite some time. And when I read this article, it actually it, it resonated in two ways. One, they talk about the fact that we're losing China experts and that China is gaining more U.S. experts. 
The, uh, the current number is about 340 students who have been involved in an exchange program after uh, 2022, which you know, makes sense because there was a zero COVID policy. There were no fly uh, restrictions into China for a long time. And I believe the number of Chinese students who are coming and studying in the United States is somewhere in the, um, I want to say hundreds of thousands, but I, I could be wrong on that one. But the point being, there are many more people from China coming here to study in the United States, which allows them to have a deep understanding of our culture, not just a understanding of our language, but if you can interact with a large assortment of Americans while you're here, you can, especially young Americans when you're at college, you can understand the perspective of the next generation, you can understand how they may address certain issues, and it's not a foolproof, of course, that things evolve, people change, but you can kind of get a picture into the zeitgeist of where the population is at any particular point. And the reason that we've stopped having a lot of students go over there, like I mentioned, it's COVID. There are also heavy restrictions on like Confucius Institutes, which would actually teach students China and set up programs where they could go overseas and actually experience China. Now, China has limited that themselves, trying to limit the amount of foreigners that can come in, uh, putting out messages that people should be uh, skeptical of foreigners because they could be spies and things of that nature. So it's not just the U.S. doing it, but it is something that the U.S. has put serious effort into and thought into limiting the amount of people that we send over to China. And that's a, it's an interesting policy for sure. And what the author is trying to get at here is that this is actually going to hurt us in the long term. Quote, this precipitous decline was driven in part by China's draconian implementation of its zero COVID policy, which ground foreign students and academic exchange to a halt for more than two years. Yet now that things have formally reopened, exchange has not rebounded as much, in large part because of concerns over the safety of traveling to China. The U.S. State Department maintains a level three travel advisory. So it's talking about that aspect of things. And here's the other part of it that uh, is going to, in this author's opinion, really, really harm us. Quote, these developments combined have led to a significant problem for the country's stock of Chinese expertise. I am involved in training the next generation of China-focused social scientists. Each year I help review the pool of applicants and recommend uh, admission for a few students who want to study domestic Chinese politics at Princeton at the PhD level. These days it is rarely seen to have an application from an American student. At the social science conference I attend, the vast majority of most promising young scholars of Chinese politics are Chinese citizens, which is a welcome development for the quality of research on China, but is not a healthy sign for the depth of American understanding of its strategic competitor. And that is exactly what we're getting at. Like I said, when the Chinese people come here and they have a deep understanding of the American culture, of how Americans see things, of how they handle different situations, we're not getting the same aspect into the mind of the Chinese people. And let's be clear, it is different because the mind of the Chinese people is not exactly a one-to-one -one relationship with the understanding and the process of the Chinese government and the mindset of the people in power in China who are actually going to make decisions, but it at least gives us an overall sentiment about how they view certain things as an entire culture. And the less expertise you have, the more ignorant you are about certain issues, the more heavy-handed and not delicately you're going to handle certain situations, which could probably end in a uh, an issue for us, considering, like the author talks about, they are a strategic competitor. So if you don't have a deep understanding of the culture and you try to, let's say that China really, the way they deal with things is a really delicate and nuanced way. They don't necessarily want bluntness. They want to kind of dance around certain things and they want to kind of imply that this is a problem, but not outright state it. And when you're in negotiations with them, and you come in in a heavy-handed fashion and you just say, no, these are the problems, we need to directly address it. And the conversation, the negotiation just shuts down from there because they don't like your heavy-handed tactics because that's not how they would deal with it. These are the small cultural things that having experts who have lived in China, who have studied China, who understand the language and the culture, these are the things that we may lose because of it. So this sort of thing is very, very important. And like the author says, China has closed off a lot of its borders. They've been trying to limit the amount of foreigners in there anyway, unless the foreigners are 
directly putting out information that benefits the Chinese Communist Party, and there are a good amount of funded foreigners within the borders of China, while they are actively trying to shut down people coming in to gain an understanding of their culture. It's not solely to restrict the understanding of their culture. It is also because they're afraid of foreign spies. So they have their own reasoning, but China is involved in this as much as the U.S. is, but the U.S. still needs to make a concerted effort in order to get more people who understand how the population of China thinks. And that's why I thought that article was very, very important, especially as someone who cares deeply about the Chinese issue and the position that's going to put us in in the upcoming years. So our next and final article, our daily delight, comes from Wu Global, and it is a video about a dog who, when you make a, a weird noise, it kind of does a woo. It kind of turns its head, its head, and I can't really describe it. I'll be honest with you. The description for this video is absolutely terrible, but the video itself is so adorable because he's just walking along, he's doing his thing, and he hears this noise, and he is like, he kind of tilts his head, but then when he hears the noise again, he tilts it the other way really rapidly, and it kind of looks like his head's on a... Uh, an axis and it's just swiveling from side to side so if you want to see that cute video or you want to read any of today's articles like i mentioned earlier there is a link in the description below that like and subscribe button also down there you can find the podcast on spotify Pocket Cast, google Podcasts, and podvine all the links are there and you can find the twitter handle at your daily flip where i post a twitter tirade every tuesday and thursday short form content no more than 10 or 10 minutes or 10 and a half minutes just thoughts rather than you know quoting from articles sometimes it comes from the stuff i'm reading sometimes it's literally things just pop into the front of my frontal lobe so with all that said there's only one more thing to say stay safe don't die